And we are live. Good morning, everyone. It is Friday, the end of the week. This is Chris Stewart, better known as Citizen Stewart on Twitter. And I'm joined today by the wonderful, the amazing, the legend, Sharif El Mecki from Philadelphia, West Philadelphia, oh, born yeah. and raised. Oh, yeah. How you doing, brother? Doing well, man. Thanks for having me on. You've been, uh, you've been busy. I have been busy every day. I've been doing a broadcast. I've been excited about it. Um, it was good to uh, connect with you and and have you agree to come on because there's been so much in my head from all these different broadcasts that I've done. And I've landed in a place back again to where you and I always land, which is thinking about Black education, like what's specific to, um, to our own plan for educating our, our children. Um, can we do like all these things that we talk about, school reform, school choice, um, smaller schools, bigger schools, Montessori, whatever you, you name it, uh, mm -hmm. free schools, homeschooling, all that. At the end of the day, it's coming back to the idea that there are so many kids that have been marginalized in history by race, class, and, and, and gender. Chris, I think I lost you. Sorry about that, man. Fell out. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I was like, wait, wait, do I have to do this show? Am I lying? <laughs> um, so what I was saying is basically that, you know, kids that have been marginalized, we've been trying to educate them forever. And we've been trying to figure out ways to advance it. Let's just get it over with. Like, you know, the idea that they're going to be be behind forever. I'm going to have to talk about it. But mm -hmm. I, I feel like we're landing in all the wrong places. Um, we, we land on integration. We land on um, just doubling down on regular public schools, just more funding, stuff like that. And I, I really don't feel like that's the answer. Never has been the answer. So today I want to talk about um, black independent schooling, uh, an issue that I think gets lost in all of the debates that we have, something you know a lot about because of your background. Right. Um, but before we jump in, for the people who are watching and for uh, to set, set this conversation up and frame it, I just want to play a video um, really quickly that I think illustrates a lot of, um, you know, it, it illustrates a lot of the issue that I want to get to. Um, so let's play that first. And then I want to get your response and, and see what anybody listening or watching thinks too. Can we do that? Let's go. All right. And if you can't hear, just quickly tell me that you can't hear it. Okay. Okay. All right. So let me set it up. This is a, a young black student, high school student who's talking about her experience in white schools, um, which is for people who believe that public school integration is everything, it is the Valhalla. She is in um, the the nirvana of of educational opportunity because she is in a um, she's in a integrated school. So let's hear from her. Yeah, so I'm just going to be telling you guys my experience going to a predominantly white school. I went to this school for nine years. I went to it for elementary and middle school, and obviously. It was predominantly white. I didn't really think that I was a lot different than my classmates until this one day in kindergarten. I had just taken out my cornrows and my real hair was out, no extensions or anything. And I didn't like it. And my mom was trying to style it in the morning. So she put it in a bun. I didn't want to put my hair in a bun. I wanted my hair down, but my hair just wouldn't stay down. But you know, mom always wins. So my hair was put in a bun for school that day. And as soon as I entered into the classroom, I ran to the bathroom. Like I kept on doing this, like, I kept on trying to lay it flat. And every time I tried to lay it flat, it would just come up again. And it really frustrated me. My hair was permed at the time, but I was overdue for a relaxer. It had been like three months since I last got a relaxer. So the roots of my hair was natural and like the ends and everything else was just permed. And I was crying because I was frustrated that my hair wouldn't stay flat. I just wanted to be like my white friends. They had long, silky hair. And when I looked at my hair, my hair wasn't like there. So maybe if I can just like lay my hair flat, I could look like my white friends. Wow, that's a fucked up way of thinking. I can't believe I was only five years old when this happened. That's so sad. And like at the time, I never wanted to admit it, but I always thought of it at the back of my head. Yikes. And throughout the years, it would just get worse. Every other year, my family and I goes back home to Nigeria. And I remember in fourth grade, it was around that time that I would have to go home back to Nigeria. And I had to explain to my um, teachers and my classmates where I was going. And I would tell them, I'm going to Nigeria. And the people in my class would just be like, 
How are you gonna get there? Doesn't like everyone in Africa live in a shack? Is there plumbing there? I don't think there's any Wi-Fi in Africa. Like just all these dumb questions and I always got irritated and to the point where I just stopped telling people where I was going. And I don't blame them for thinking that way because on TV, especially CNN, the kids who are starving in Africa are always shown and like the huts and the shacks are always shown and poverty is always shown so so like the white people just didn't know any better so when i would try to tell them um yes there's wi-fi yes there are airports there no i don't live in a shack they just be in awe and i remember like all the time teachers would just butcher the fuck out of my name like they couldn't even begin to pronounce it and because of all of these like events constantly happening um it made me hate being black which is so sad but that's how I felt back then. I didn't want to be black. I just thought life would just be easier if I was just white. Man, so what do you think? Man, that's gut wrenching. And she's not alone. Like there's, you know, um, thousands and thousands of, of students who are subjected to that without the tools to be able to navigate it, without the, you know, this uh, internalized oppression is mm. it's so real it's so acute and it's so damaging to the psyche of 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 black and brown children but we're talking about like black children it is so damaging it limits their their thinking it limits their their uh beliefs about themselves and just as importantly the beliefs about their communities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean look how she ended though she ended with first of all she ended with a few things number one never wanting to talk about her roots in africa again Yes. Because it just was too tiring. Mm -hmm. Second, really just feeling always constantly self-conscious about her hair and her her naturalness. What we didn't show in this, she goes on to go to a black school after this. And it's the first time she's felt comfortable with her being, with her skin, her hair, her her way of being. And she sees it as somewhat liberator, uh, liber I don't know, liberatory. I think liberatory. that might be a word. Yeah. Yep. Yep. To leave the white school and go to the black school. But she ends with... I just thought it would be easier to be white at some point, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Now think about that. Um, this is one person talking, but I, we imagine that this story is is more than one person, right? Um, how many black kids are in these schools that are supposed to be the nirvana of all education? Like if we can just get black kids into white schools, um, the achievement gap and everything else would go away. Mm -hmm. um, like when we see a story like this, why is this missing from the debate? Why doesn't anybody want to talk about the fact that that's actually not the end all be all? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's for a lot of reasons. Some of it's just pure propaganda, right? Like the same idea, like people can look at the outside of America and just think like, oh, the, the, the roads must be paved in gold and everyone must be doing well. And because there's certain aspect of America and as part of America's, you know, exceptionalism and, and the myths of those, they portray it in a certain way. A lot of that though is really portraying whiteness in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And so as long as you're in proximity to, you know, to us, if you go to our schools, if you're in our neighborhood, despite the fact that we're gonna run from you, despite the fact that, you know, white flight will increase regardless and is shown across the country throughout history that that, that continues. And despite the fact that when you are actually in a lot of these integrated schools, you are still in a caste system. You are still in this apartheid mm -hmm. system. You are still in the basement of a beautiful, gleaming school, mm -hmm. right? And that's mm -hmm. the same portrayal of America, the perception of America. Oh, America, that's, you know, land of, of milk and honey. Who's in the basement of America, mm -hmm. right? It continues to be the same people. And so this idea of the anti-Blackness is portrayed. And a lot of times people think, oh, once you're getting into a school, that because I, I love kids, that I love black kids. That's not synonymous. It's interesting that you just said, even when you get into these schools, you're still in a caste system. And we look nationally at, at folks that really push integration, like Nicole Hannah-Jones, who says that the way to end the caste system, the racial caste system in the United States is integration. Like that is literally the way to get rid of it. And, and what you just said is instructive. Even when you get into the building, you're still in the caste system, right? Oh, yeah. Um, Absolutely. Michelle here has a comment that says, I absolutely hated my experiences in predominantly white schools, kids and teachers and the microaggressions. Glad to be able to teach black and brown kids. They know who they are. They know that I support them. I love them. I will always fight for them. Um, I mean, isn't that a sentiment we need to hear more of? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and again, it doesn't mean that, you know, if, if you're trying to, we're also always talking about like parents making the best decision for their children. Right. But what we caution folks that you can't send a child in a situation without the tools, mm-hmm. without those conversations. Right. Like because it is going to be a, a very oppressive and children over and over and over again, they become adults and then talk about here's the hole that was in my soul throughout my childhood. Wow. And I, I never talked about it. I, I you put me there. So I know you wanted me there. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to just blend in, assimilate. I didn't want you coming up with drama. So we have to know that that's a general perception of a lot of children. They'll mm-hmm. be reluctant to share some of the pain that can be chronic. Yeah, it feels try like, to live with it. you know, when you put a kid into a, an environment, the implicit kind of message that you send to them is that it's it's approved and it's OK. Mm-hmm. So if they find themselves in a traumatic situation that you put them in. They're not going to be thinking all the time to tell you that that's what's going on, because implicitly you have already told them as the authority in their life that this is OK. Right. And on top of that, when you're abused in whatever, including emotional, a lot of times children will internalize that like I must have done something wrong. Mm. This is me. And so when you're black in the, in that situation, not only is it me, oh, it's my blackness that's the problem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not their um not their macro because a lot of these are not even microaggression. We gotta call like it's either racism or macroaggressions <laughs> in, in the least. <laughs> you know, um, you know <laughs> I, yeah. I think giving the students language and making sure that that the conversation about race is constantly happening and that they feel comfortable saying. Hey, this is what I experienced today. Mm-hmm. Um, this is how I handled it, and I need support. Yeah, you know, what I think is really interesting is how she, the young lady talks about her hair, and she always just wanted to lay it down flat, and she just wanted to be like the the white girls around her, and she just wanted to kind of transcend her her race, her own humanness. And and I think in terms of academics, I wonder what message that sends that this is also the place where you're smart. Yeah. Like, like you, you need to transcend your blackness to get to a place like this so that you can actually be smart and learn. And I just wonder, you know, about our own people not realizing that they're sending that message. They're sending it to other adults. They're sending it to people who are not in our community. And they're sending it to our kids that the way to be smart is to transcend your blackness and, and get into schools where you're not the majority. I mean, isn't that an insulting message to be sending to our kids and dangerous? Yeah, I mean, it, people laughed when um, OJ said it, but this is what the message we're also subtly and sometimes overtly sending to our kids. Well, bro, that's because OJ I, said it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean but, but listen, yeah. but our children also are, are given messages that that's what they should do. And so mm-hmm. if the same people who ridicule OJ were saying, hey, I'm not black, I'm OJ. Mm-hmm. They're saying, you're not black, you're smart. You're mm-hmm. not black, you're American. You're not, you're mm-hmm. not black. You're in this situation. You're in this, uh, you know, area of privilege and affluence, right? Like those are the messages. I, I have wealthy friends who sent their kids to wealthy schools, school districts, and the 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 racism that they experience, they're not they're not protected from it. Mm-hmm. They experience the same type of racism and comments and and uh, low expectations in those affluent areas that they do when they have uh, other teachers in a poor area. So there's something that's a common thread and that's their blackness. So how are we going to address it? How are we gonna protect them? Um, And how do we make sure that anti-racism and pro-blackness is, you know, is part of the culture? And just saying, oh, we'll integrate is not the answer. I mean, do you think it's okay if, um, if a girl or boy, um, who's like this young lady that we we saw the video of, goes to a school like that, gets very good grades, um, does well on tests, gets into college, gets out of college with a college degree, and goes on to live a good life. Um, do you think it's okay to accept some of the the hit to your culture if you end up in what's considered to be successful? Uh, you know, is it okay then? Do you, are, are you more okay with it if you think that people end up being successful in life? I mean, but that's the thing. That's that's all about the individual choices we make. And I think as as communities who've always been uh, in the history of this country had to resist oppression, it's always this idea of like, how do I balance uh, the collective good with my individual um, choices, mm-hmm. right? And can the, can freedom for can liberation for all Black people 
how does that live in a space of individual values and goals? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so how how do they come together? I think that's always been the struggle of, you know, of trying to resist within a system that's so skewed in the direction again against us. Right. Like how mm-hmm. how many people do we need to be in positions of power? Right. Like originally look at W.B. Du Bois and talk about talented tenth. We need a certain group of folks to be able to get to a space and and lead up. At the end, W.B. Du Bois said, you know what? A lot of these talented tenth folks are hard hearted. Mm -hmm. I'm Mm -hmm. I'm abandoning this idea that they will help support people. They're going to start looking down on them. Mm -hmm. We look at Philadelphia, the history um, of Philadelphia, blacks in Philadelphia. They they had a a peculiar um, history where they had a a large number of wealthy black people Mm -hmm. in Philadelphia Mm -hmm. um, who had a history here and they had businesses and things like that. They talk about like how they their comments about other black people folks who maybe have just moving up uh, during the great migration and as well as, you know, folks in poverty, how they talked about them. If you mm-hmm. did not look at them, you would have thought that there was a white person talking about them, a racist white person. Right. Yeah, and, so, you and I talked about this. We talked mm-hmm. about the Philadelphia NAACP had on the back of their identification cards, their NAACP cards on the back of it, it said that one of the purposes of the NAACP was to separate the black middle class from the disrepute of the black masses. Exact words. Exactly. (laughs) Like the whole goal of the organization was to set aside the black middle class of Philadelphia from the disrepute of the black masses. You know, exactly. ladies and ge- gentlemen, welcome to the black bourgeoisie, who, by the way, turn out to be the people today who are the most against things like independent black schooling and, and you know, um, black schools and charter schools and black choice and all these things. They're the ones who will tell you that white uh, water is wetter. You know, white mm-hmm. ice is is colder. If we can just get all of our black kids integrated into bureaucratized uh, unionized government schools run mostly by white teachers and mostly by white people that um, that prosperity will ensue afterwards. Um, is that the problem that we're having right now, though, even internally in blackness, we're having a class war between the black middle class who are deeply invested in the system as it is. They've moved out to the suburbs in a lot of cases. They've gotten their kids into what is considered good schools. And now they just want to sell the black underclass on the idea that that's best for them, too. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, and it's not new. I mean, this is mm. not a new phenomenon. Um, I think when when you find some measure of success, as it's described, as you just described it, how they internalize it, uh, that this is ha- this is what success looks like, then it almost becomes follow this exact blueprint. And I think a lot of times they're not being honest about what they actually experienced. Mm-hmm. They're not being mm-hmm. honest about how many seats that you know, the white power structure will give of black folks and what they have to look like, what they have to sound like. They're not telling the full story. Mm -hmm, Right. mm -hmm. And so they're giving this kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Do as do as I say. And I do. I'm I'm like showing you how to arrive to the promised land. Mm -hmm. But it, it belies the very nature of white supremacy. It it falsely promotes uh, something that really doesn't exist for masses and masses of people. Mm-hmm. If it had, we would have seen it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it's interesting that people who really promote public integration, public school integration as the sole intervention to improve academics for black people will say to you that integration is the only thing in history that has ever really worked. And you hear that from old, I, I heard it this morning on something I watched with, um, Professor Rooks, who has a book called Segronomics, the entire book is about how charter schools are dangerous because they're segregating black people. And the only thing that has really ever worked is integration. That echoes the same thing that you'll hear from Nicole Hannah-Jones and a series of like, you know, uh, Darius, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, Rucker Johnson, Professor Rucker Johnson. And um, and I can keep going down the list of mm-hmm. professors, black professors and others who will write these books basically saying it's the only thing that has ever worked. Um, so what would you say in response? They're, they're talking about research shows yeah. that it's the only thing that's ever worked. Yeah. I mean, and I, I think they're, they're skewing the research a little bit. They're not looking at, they're not looking at, uh, many other, uh, opportunities that black people have employed and exercised and used. Mm-hmm. Um, you look at schools like Bordentown, 
and the the just the the community that they established, the ecosystem of ac- black excellence mm. to and through that that uh, exhibited. They're not talking about schools that you know, like in Philadelphia, like Marcus Garvis Shule and the school I attended, Nitha Musasa. Like, how would that fit into? You're more likely to be able to do a whole lot of those than to get hundreds of thousands of black children in Philadelphia into integrated schools. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're far more likely to be able to do that. And the history of, of and if, there, if you're gonna look at history, also look at both sides. What happens when you try to integrate a neighborhood? What mm-hmm. happens when uh, black and brown people move into a neighborhood or move into a school? What happens? Mm-hmm. There, there, there's a history of that too. And when you say what happens, I mean, basically what happens is eventually it's fluid. Like you move in, it's good for five minutes or maybe it's bad for five minutes and then the others move out and it becomes an, a segregated neighborhood again, right? Like like white flight is real, right? It's like can't, we can't real. keep chasing people. Like, <laughs> like, you know, Chris Rock has this comment about like, you know, the black malls were the malls that white people used to go to. <laughs> and you would know, <laughs> you would know the difference, like, you know, and, and I think it's really interesting that that's true, that there were, I, I can think of a mall or two in Louisiana that um, I never went to as a kid and went back to as an adult and um, never went to as a kid because they were white malls and you didn't really go to them. And, um, and going back there now, and they're all black malls and half the stores are shut down on the inside. Most of them, you know, are hair salons and stuff like that in the mall. And, um, and that just to me is how fluid this integration thing is, you know, it, it, it's, it's all white, then it's mixed and it becomes a little bit more increasingly people of color. And then eventually it becomes all people of color and the white people evaporate. And then we're supposed to just keep chasing them from malls and schools and houses, um, not realizing that that's a trick. That's a game. Yeah. I I mean, not only a trick, like that's the essence of white supremacy. Mm-hmm. You you mm-hmm. need to, you need to to be here. You need to be here with me. I, I'd much rather. And and it, and it, it's interesting. Like you know, there was this uh, quote one time. It was basically like you know, the worst uh, place to be is not the worst. I shouldn't say the worst, but when you find your blackness later on in life, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. you're trying mm-hmm. to tell black people exactly what they should do, mm-hmm. or if you've been in this privileged state and you haven't been around the people. You haven't sacrificed for the people. You haven't lived with the people mm-hmm. in that kind of way. But then you're lecturing them about this is the only way. Mm-hmm. Like your mm-hmm. way, it's very few are on that trail. Mm-hmm. It's only possible for very few to be on that trail. So what makes more sense is to run towards the black people. Run towards the black people. Not mm-hmm. Don't run towards the white people. Run towards black people and let's have a level of, of responsibility to that and say, okay, what are the institutions? That idea of self-determination, mm. I, like I, 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 that, you know, I try to live by that as much as possible. Self-determination, how do we make these decisions and build institutions within our community so that people aren't running, uh, you know, away? And you, you that just, we own it. Yes, yeah, so yeah. that we own the means of production. Zakia says, what are these professors uh, talking about when they don't talk about um, the psychic violence that black children endure in these white schools? Um, Deborah Watkins says, schools are never truly integrated. Even in those schools, um, they are segregated and they're segregating the black children. Michelle says, we are part to blame. We need to stop chasing white people and they have uh, and what they have and start creating our own. Colin Seal says, separate is not inherently unequal. Unequal is an in- inherently unequal. Uh, Michelle agrees. She says, three black kids in all white schools is not integration at all. <laughs> Zakia, I mean, these folks are going off in the comments. Zakia <laughs> says, white liberalism wants to control what black people do and think. The best way to do that is through education. Education is very political. Wow, wow. They're bringing it to us, Sharif, this morning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I feel like I'm in race church. Um, <laughs> so, like, so like, look, look at these comments and what people are actually saying. Why is this so different than the conversation that is had in mixed company and in broader society? Like, this isn't these comments that I'm seeing and that I'm hearing are pretty common to me. You know, I, I hear people say this in our own community all the time, privately. Why, what's the difference? Where's the disconnect between these comments and what is being said by our professors who are experts nationally? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the, or when we have professors or experts that are not of the people, 
I think they speak the language of academia and not our academia, you know, mm. uh, another mm. group of people, academia. It's like, you know, when my martial arts teacher used to say like, hey, we, you know, we practice African martial arts because it's not just the kicking and the punching and the style. It's if you study Japanese martial arts, you're going to learn Japanese language. Mm -hmm. You're going to study Japanese culture and be imbued in Japanese culture. You're going to bow to the Japanese flag. And so if you look at that in the academic world, it's the mm -hmm. same thing. Mm -hmm. If you're studying from that lens, you're going to be imbued in that culture, in that mm -hmm. uh, in their flag instead of in our flag. And our flag is about like how to use education for liberation. And you can't convince me going there and being forced to not take rigorous courses, to be uh, suspended and disciplined at, at uh, high rates, at, to be marginalized every step of the way, that that's the path towards liberation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's funny, though, that it is talked about as the great equalizer. If you can get into the same schools other people are going to, you can do well, graduate, go to college. Um, you're all all as well, but we don't really talk about the culture stripping that goes on in that process and whether or not the end goal is really to be successful materially and culturally or to be must be successful materially. And I think our black bourgeoisie are very much on the tip of making it really does mean making it into academia, making it into the white circles. Um, this idea that you would run your own, like your own school that you would do your own thing, that you would seek out black scholarship and go why? strictly to HBCUs. That's why not would a, you do that? Why would you do yeah, that? Why oh would gosh. you do that, right? Like, aren't you trying to be successful? Yeah. Um, but it's a shame because these are the people that we consider to be our primary intellectuals. These are the people that produce knowledge for us and they're totally beholden to another team. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, to the point where they'll come after folks like you who say things like, you know, um, we should have self-determination. We should be running black schools. And they'll almost laugh at that in some ways. Mm -hmm. Like to you, to, to them, you, you'll you sound romantic, like yeah. nostalgic for something that doesn't exist. Yeah, I mean, they, they don't even look at it as nostalgia because they are like, it never, they, in their heads, that was never a success, right? Mm -hmm. Like they, they look at it as something, as something different. And, and I think, so when you look at somebody like, and this, I'm going to say this, and I'm not trying to disparage uh, her, but like Diane Nash, she's a hero. Mm -hmm. right? You know, I, I love her. When you look at when she first started civil rights uh, movement in that work, it was for a different purpose. And I think you're getting to like, what's the purpose mm -hmm. of education? Mm -hmm. Is it for liberation or is it for upward mobility? Is it, can it be both? And if it can be both, what does it look like? And upward mobility, is it individualistic or is it communal? Right. And I think a lot of what they are peddling is the individualistic upward mobility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the individualistic choices that doesn't, you know, it's, it's almost back to Reaganomics and trickle down theory. Mm -hmm. If I get if I get this and a couple of us get this because they have to know mm -hmm. that with hundreds of thousands of, of black students. There are not hundreds of thousands of white student families who are going to say, yes, let's integrate. When that mm -hmm. happens, mm -hmm. it's at the bare minimum, some boutique school. We have them in Mount Airy. Mount Airy is like one of the most integrated places in the state. The schools in those areas are, are pretty integrated. But it, you also see that it's very integrated, K to four. And then five through eight, the white kids disappear. Mm -hmm. Right. And you mm -hmm. see that pattern after pattern after pattern. But back to Diane Ratt. Uh, Diane Nash, when she first start, got into the movement, one of the things she said was they should give black people, and I'm paraphrasing, they should give black people more opportunity because maybe one of them will create the bomb. So what was she talking about? She was like, that was in the communist era, right? So mm -hmm, she looked at mm -hmm. opportunity for black wow. Americans just to assimilate into militarism, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? And so you can mm -hmm. look at that quote wow. and that mindset and and lay it over how our black middle class uh, too often does in the academia world, mm. right? I want to keep calling them the black star. bourgeoisie too. Black I want to keep calling them. <laughs> want to keep calling them the black bourgeoisie because it's the most fitting. The book, the black bourgeoisie, told us years ago exactly what the psychology of this group of us is is really about. And really, at the end of the day, they're about themselves. They're craving. The Du Bois, the W.E.B. Du Bois versus Booker T. Washington dynamic, 
which later became the Malcolm versus Martin dynamic. I don't know. We have to always do duality. Mm -hmm. But Du Bois was really about in the beginning the education of the elite, the black mm -hmm. elite, the, yeah. the 10 percent. And that tradition carries on today. If we look at who's in the black elite of, of knowledge, the, the professors and the people who are um, lecturing us through books and YouTube videos and speeches that they give to predominantly white audiences, that is the black bourgeoisie of today. There are, it is a form of black mind control, and they are trying to argue us out of the idea that we should have our own schools, that we should do our own education, we should seek out our own scholarship. That's a problem we have to confront before we confront white people. Oh, think? oh, absolutely. I mean, and, and we talked about this before. You know, one of my favorite NAACP members was uh, Cecil B. Moore, who, mm -hmm. you know, who they ended up banishing from the national office, banished him from the Philadelphia office, like totally marginalized. And was like, oh, no, because his his uh, what he was looked at as radical was really just pro black. And so when pro black in black circles is looked at as radical, that's problematic, mm -hmm. right? Look, when I was a kid, and this, this thing is not just around black people, this is a, it's a tool to oppress the masses, right? And so when I was a kid, we used to watch, uh, you know, I was overseas and we used to watch these uh, Indian revolutionary movies where they would talk about their struggle against the British empire. It wasn't that, it was tons and tons of, of British officers who were running things. They'd get the towns to 10th of Indians That's right. to run That's right. and oppress. And you look at colonial Africa. It wasn't just that, oh, you know, there were hordes of white people that were controlling everything. Right. They would get the talented 10th, the so-called talented 10th, the mindless 10th sometimes, mm. and, and oh. use them to control the masses. Sharif, that's got to be your book, man. You got to write the book. The Mindless Tenth? Wow. <laughs> you got to write that book. I'll, I will buy a million copies of that book and send it to all my friends for Christmas. <laughs> I, I hear you. I hear you. Um, even listen to me messing it up, send it to him for Christmas. I'll send it to him for Kwanzaa. You go ahead and write that book. <laughs> you do it. The Mindless Tenth, and everybody will get a copy of, of, of that book. Um, yeah. It transcends uh, just here. It is a strategy yeah. of white supremacy, and we have to recognize it for what it is. So what's interesting to me about this, look at how we have talked about this conversation so far, so far about black determination, determination in education, the liberationist ideas about, you know, doing your own, striking out on your own. And when you bring that up today in the normal conversation about education, that is seen as something totally different than that's seen as a privatization scheme. Mm. Like you're trying to break this great system that has existed, the, the, the democratic system of education that has existed always for everybody. You're trying to break that up and somehow you're working for the white masters to do that. I, I'm trying to like stick with the logic here of yeah. how black people starting <laughs> black schools is luck. actually, <laughs> can you help me understand this? How black people, starting black schools or wanting the choice of which schools they go to is somehow a version of working for the white masters. Help me with that. That, Yeah. That, I mean, that's, that's weirdness. just, I mean, it's backwards thinking this brainwashing. Listen, one of, one of the, uh, one of the mamas in our, in our community a long time ago, she, after seeing, she was a community leader um, and she worked for the post office, but after seeing just, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of black children uh, where their intellectual audaciousness was being undermined and mm -hmm. assaulted, where their you know racial consciousness was being destroyed, she decided to open up a school. And so my oldest child went to the, went to the school. It was called Academy of the Way. Mm -hmm. When she decided to do this, the amount of black people who told her she was crazy for leaving a good job she had a good government job with a pension and like, why would she, <laughs> why would she leave yeah. Yeah. and, and go start a school? And she was just like, you're asking me, why am I leaving the plantation to, to build a, a, a fertile ground for liberation for our children in this neighborhood, mm -hmm. in this neighborhood. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so she, when she would tell me this story and I was a, I was a first year teacher, you know, when the second year teacher, when this was happening, um, you know, it, it always stuck with me that there were a group of folks who would like look at you as crazy. That's that crazy Negro, right? Like, mm -hmm. and that was, that was always like, the, the Negro that was on the plantation fussing and, and resisting the most, they're like, oh, he crazy, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's <laughs> a level of insanity yeah, to yeah. insert your independence in this system. 
Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. need we need more crazy Negroes. We need more mm. crazy Negroes creating schools, cr- starting schools, private schools, charter schools, whatever. Like we need that. We need to make sure mm. that we are creating fertile ground for back to that that intellectual audaciousness that our children have inherently. That is that is just too often watered down, pushed out, or demoralized. You know, you know, right when we get off of this today, I'm going to form the T-shirt that says we need more crazy Negroes. Uh, Absolutely. (laughs) I'll give you credit. I'll put, you know, dash uh, Sharif (laughs) El-Mekki on it. It's unnecessary. unnecessary. I'll I'll, I'll buy the shirt. I'll buy the Um, shirt. We got good comments here. Folks are still, I mean, basically going off in the comments about about this, and I think in a positive way. Yahara says public school narratives are led by the Christopher Columbuses of the world. Most mm. policymakers have an agenda to capitalize on the black, brown, and Latino struggles to keep us oppressed educationally. Um, that is a uh, Yahara or Yahira. Uh, uh, um, help me with your name. Um, you are saying a lot in that statement, and. and other folks should read it because she says more there that I think is really in, important. Um, and and Colin Seal says, what if the talented 10th weren't miseducated? I believe that Du Bois did, um, um, that the talented 10th play an important role in uplifting people. But when our talented 10th becomes talented by leaving their own communities, frowning upon the same communities and believing the lie that winning is proximity to whiteness, um, we get what we have now. We get what we got now. I think the problem with that is, is that's exactly what happens when you set up elites. So when you say from the beginning that we're going to have a talented tent, that we're going to educate the best of our race or the best of our men, the difference between Du Bois and, and, um, uh, Du Bois and, 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 and Booker T. Washington and folks in the comments and everybody ask, you know, give me a hard time if I'm wrong about this. Du Bois really started from the beginning of we have to educate the best of black people first and make an elite out of them, and they will eventually lead the way for everybody else. Du Bois came out of white northern environments where he was eating cucumber sandwiches with white intellectuals, while Booker T. Washington had came out of a life of slavery, and he was saying we have to educate the masses. We have to build capital, build things that we own ourselves, and we need to stay out of the fights that Du Bois is talking about because he's talking about that for a handful of people. We're talking about the masses. One of them set up schools all across the South, 5,000, 5,500 schools, and then colleges, right? The other one died miserable in his old age, never have seen the the reality of his vision and being deeply dissatisfied with the black elite that he had helped to to formulate. Tell me if I'm wrong, Sharif, because you have heard me say this before. And anybody in the comments, you know, I hate how beat you, me up. Uh, you know, I hate how you characterize that. And I know, a, <laughs> I know, I know you do. I know you do. <laughs> and I think there, I think there's a third, uh, a third person. That oh, we bro, don't start with here. me with this third way stuff. But go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I think the third person because I think I think too often we're pitched in this battle to the either or, or. Mm-hmm. when when historically we've looked at it as more of a circle than this line. Okay. More, instead of the seesaw, suppose we look at it differently. Suppose we also, in in addition to taking the best of of both of those brothers, we also insert a Marcus Garvey Mm -hmm. in that same time frame, who was Mm -hmm. also beefing, right? Like that was the beef. Mm -hmm. A lot of times he, that third part, Marcus Garvey and Mm -hmm. his contribution, is forgotten about in that time space mm-hmm. and supposed to mm-hmm. be insert and take the best of all three what would they be saying mm-hmm. if we take the the optimal levels we'd be saying like the education is absolutely crucial to our mm-hmm. you know our fight for liberation mm-hmm. independent schools has mm-hmm. to be important mm-hmm. a holistic education because even even there were people who who uh worked for booker t washington but they were also subtly trying to expand what they thought was a very narrow uh, view of uh, we have to educate them in in, in uh, jobs of service and mm-hmm. things like that and farming and 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 things where we would be working only in one sphere in American life where they were saying like no we're going to add some more because we also believe that you know what we also need fighters at the table fighters in politics fighters in in all aspects mm-hmm. because it is a mm-hmm. holistic approach to liberation. Right. And then Marcus Garvey with the the kind of idea of pan-Africanism and, and black pride and all of that. Like so 
for me, our intellectual genealogy is tied to all three of those. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And uh, what I hear you saying is don't get lost up in this Western duality thing. Exactly. This up or down Satan or, or Christ, good or bad, hot or cold thing, you know, Malcolm or Martin. Mm -hmm. now, I don't know like what the third way would have been between Malcolm and Martin. I don't know who you would say was the third character in that play. I think it's instructive to think about the Garvey thing. When I always talk about the duality between Booker T and, and Du Bois, it's specifically because Booker T was the first black superstar in education mm -hmm. and Du Bois was hired specifically to be against him and to oppose him. That's how he came to prominence in the first place. That's why they invested in him was to be the anti Booker T Washington. So he set himself up for that duality thing. And, and, um, what you just added, I think, is really important. Like, I, I haven't really thought about how Garvey added a different flavor, like, you know, within their same time. We don't have to really talk that much about Garvey. And I wonder if it's because um, because the, the system got to him before they got to everybody else. Like, they stopped him from seeing his big vision before he built much. Yeah. I don't know why that is. I mean, and part of it is is the sniping that other black, right? Like, W.B. Du Bois was snipe at Marcus Garvey like, like you know, like nothing else, right? Like yeah. it would it would talk about like you know oh this and that almost like sicking, you know the authorities on him and, and, and mm -hmm. like that was like call it Becky calling the police kind of thing, right? And so, <laughs> uh, like that that's kind of what Did it was. Did you just it, say Du Bois was the Becky of the I, time? I, I, you know I hate. To, I, oh, I want to take that back. W yeah, no, you, you don't. He's our ancestor, but you know no, he you evolved. Don't. You know what I mean? I, I yeah. I'm I'm, I'm grateful for like how he evolved, how he looked at education. That's right. Um, how he still in his context was still resisting, right? Like he was still when he came to when he came to Philadelphia, you know, uh, University of Pennsylvania uh, commissioned him to do this study, right? Like kind of the really first social experiment, you know, the social he kind of created the school of socialism um, mm -hmm. uh, social studies in, in, in the country. Mm -hmm. And University of Pennsylvania would not give him an office. Wow. And he so was at Harvard, right? He was a Harvard yeah, grad. Yeah, Harvard the grad. Right? Harvard grad. Yeah. Yep. Wow. That Fisk, Harvard, right? And so they commissioned him but said, but you can't do that work from here. Mm. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my my blog page actually, Philly Seventh Ward, is a is a, a tribute to WB's Du Bois, his his evolution and the mm. intellectual contributions that he's made. When he studied Philadelphia, he divided it up into wards. Mm -hmm, and the mm -hmm. seventh ward was really in that South Philadelphia area. And it was the uh, most populated section mm -hmm. of the city of black people. So that's mm -hmm. where all the black people. And so when I say Philly seventh ward, I'm just saying now I'm talking about Philly's black people, which are now dispersed. I'm glad uh, you just mentioned that to me because I have never known that that's what that came from. Mm -hmm. And uh, all my family's from the seventh ward of New Orleans. So oh, I just right, I've right. always I've always just looked at your blog as being like, you know, reference to my fam, but you know <laughs> <laughs> not paying attention to the Philly part. It um, could it could be that too, but it, but yeah, it's uh you know, it was it's Philly centric in the way that it was thinking about the black people in Philadelphia. And at yeah. that time when he studied, this is where all the black people and so their needs, their aspirations, he was looking at them and trying to capture that and mm. me on a very tiny, tiny scale trying to do uh, something similar, particularly around education. So my colleague Erica Sanzi says that she thinks that uh, Sharif is right, that the binaries are a major problem, not only on this topic, but almost all important topics. She also wants to remind you that Becky is now Karen. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Becky has become Karen. So now and I'm I, always a little Karen, bit behind with the cultural reference. I'm always a little bit behind. I, I just wrote a piece at the end of it where I said, you can send as many of the Karen committee for me as you want. I'm not backing down. And I had to pull that out of there because I was like, somebody's going to get, get give me a hard time about this. <laughs> um, Michelle wants us to remember that Du Bois did um, still provide value. And Absolutely. Zakia wants to say that he was definitely used, though, against Garvey. And I definitely think he was also used against um, Booker T. Let me say this about the Booker T thing, because I actually wasn't always a fan. Then I read Up From Slavery and I thought, wow, this is a it's a very harsh story, like like where he came from. I hadn't known it before. I never learned it in school. I had to learn it in later life. Mm -hmm. um, the real story of like where he came from and and still didn't pick up on him. I still wasn't a big fan even after that. It wasn't until I got to the fact that he had built all these schools that I didn't know about like thousands and thousands of schools and then the colleges. I always knew about HBCUs. I didn't know about the 5,500 um, 
primary schools that he, he, he developed. And then I saw a Federal Reserve study on it that basically showed how much of an impact that had had uh, on black people. Right. Like that's where the first black middle class came from. And so much of the criticism about him was about him just wanting us to take subservient positions or whatnot, except for the fact that out of all those schools came people who knew how to do architecture, build buildings, made a lot of uh, historic um, scientific advancements. Um, a lot of stuff that we know about black history um, in terms of achievement came out of those schools. Mm -hmm. Right. And it wasn't in one field was across fields, was scientists and architects and doctors. We still to this day get the majority of our black doctors um, and, and lawyers and, and teachers out of many of those black schools, oh, yeah. right? right? Absolutely. So to me, different than Du Bois and Garvey who died without having made that contribution, this one seems more fitting to me today as we have people like you starting schools. Right, like thinking that the the way to our liberation and freedom is really to start with owning the process of developing the black brain, the black the black capacity. So why, when you do that, should you be facing so much pushback? Why why would you? It's it's not like this is new. This isn't a new thing. Why would you be facing facing pushback for simply wanting to start schools? Yeah, I I think one because it's something that would work. So when you're talking about like, you know, uh, when groups of people are used against another group of folks, like what would, if we were able to now say, hey, we're gonna open up 5,000 liberatory focused schools for black children across this country. You would think because of the student outcomes for generations that people will run to it. You would have, you might as well be saying that you're, you know, creating something that insidious you know, and oppressive, right? Just the idea of you doing something independent, being a, you know, an independent Negro, one of those crazy <laughs> Negroes. Crazy you're Negroes, going, yeah. Uh-huh, you're gonna create, you're gonna get the ire from not just white mm -hmm. people, but other people. Because again, when you, and you've, you've talked about this in the past, when you affront people's, uh, their, their worldview, if they are tied to the system, if they are, uh, hook, line, and sinker in the system already. Anything you say beyond that is a threat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything on the mm -hmm. margins of that is a threat. Anything outside of that system. And, and when you look at it this way, you know, I, I try to look at things like from the broad view and the world perspective, that is consistent no matter where you go, right? If mm -hmm. you have all the scientists saying one thing and then you have somebody else saying something else, they're, the first thing they, they do is they look at them. They try to, what did, what did Gandhi say? First, they look, laugh at you. They ridicule you. They get angry. You mm -hmm. know, they hate you, right? Like mm -hmm. it goes through this same pattern. That's the same thing with us in regards to this education. But, you, I'm know, I would, you, I'm, you know, I'm glad you mm -hmm. made it a global thing. I'm glad you like you expand the view out. Because when I think about what I've studied now in the worldview, the Maori people of New Zealand the native people of New Zealand mm -hmm. developed their entire school system after going through school reform for years that didn't work. Yep. And part of it was because they figured out that their kids would never get a humane education in the colonist context. So they, mm -hmm. they started with kindergartens. Mm -hmm. They ended up with K through university, mm -hmm. um, Maori schools, fully recovered, uh, culturally important um, information to their kids starting in the earliest grades going all the way through college. And that was in that was part of their revelation that they could never really reform schools enough. Reform wasn't going to work enough. Um, and the same thing with the Zapistas of of Mexico. Now I'm saying the name wrong. Zapatistas. Zapatistas. Uh, yeah, of of Mexico, who overthrew their their schools, their government schools. They built their own schools. They elected their own teachers, developed their own curriculum, mm -hmm. and took it all the way over. So we have a global context for what native and indigenous peoples have done to free themselves educationally, just somehow doesn't really seem to reach us as black folks in the, the educational mainstream in the United States yet. Um, yeah. What do you see as the pathway to replacing our educated Negroes who are out front, who see our integration as the only intervention we should have? What do you see as the, <clears throat> the way that we address them and get more people to the forefront who actually wanna start schools and do schools? Yeah, I, I think the number one thing is that we have to highlight, uplift, support the the black leaders and black teachers who are starting black schools as much as possible. Um, the, like they should be on the forefront. We should be talking, celebrating them, supporting them, um, and rallying around them. So that's number one. Mm -hmm. Like you know, first, 
protecting what we have and then trying to replicate it. Like I, I say this all the time, you know, if you're a parent and you want your child to go to whatever, that's that's great. And I want more black people starting schools, that's more right. black leaders starting schools. I'm so encouraged when when we have like, you know, these these uh, wealthy entertainers, athletes and so on and so forth who say, you know what, I'm starting a school. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's my goal. Like I understand even if I went through this, you know, uh, you know, this private white private school, I understand that that my people need better educational outcomes, need better educational opportunities, right? We and 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 the other thing is we have to call these people out. So my view of it is always Malcolm X in the 60s demanded that the New York public education system turn 30% of those schools over to black people. Wow. In New York. So the the size of of that, right? Even Mm in the 60s, Mm -hmm. right? It's still a a humongous city, densely populated. He said 30% turn these schools over to black people because y'all don't know what the hell y'all are doing. Mm -hmm. So whoever stands, I'm I'm like, so some our intellectuals today, I'm like, you stand against Brother Malcolm. So you already just need to sit down. Because well, I mean, like, truthfully, on that point, you know, Malcolm said a lot of things that they stand against. I mean, oh, he said absolutely. only a, a damn fool turns his his kids over to his enemy and expects them to become educated. Well, right? they don't. But they, that's the thing. But they don't look at white supremacy as their enemy in a lot of times. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Remember, they, um, they see black ignorance as their enemy. They exactly. really do. The, this one yeah. brother said something very powerful that, you know, a lot of the folks that you're describing, these black bourgeoisie, they're not trying to end white supremacy. They're trying to better their position within it. Wow. Oh, That's yeah. a very different wow. mind frame, right? Like, so yeah. if, I, if I'm if i an activist, if I was mm. raised by activists, if I went to Nitha Musasa, if I had a framework to understand the black struggle in this country as well as globally, right, then, then I'm chasing their vision because they were chasing their ancestors' vision. And I'm doing that my, throughout my entire career. Mm-hmm. But if mm-hmm. I'm another type of person who's just like, hey, you know what, let's just eat around the margins and try to get as comfortable and, and move up as much as we can individually mm-hmm. in white supremacy. But if I look at it as a communal, I can't see community success within white supremacy. I can only see individualized success within mm-hmm. white supremacy. Mm-hmm. That's so deep. Like not trying to end white supremacy, but trying to improve your position within it. <laughs> wow. That's um, the struggle. That's why mm-hmm. our, That's why they would resist 5,000 schools. That's why they will resist 100 Nitha Musasas across this country. That's mm-hmm. why. You know, both um, Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X told us to beware white liberals. Um, yeah. And, you know, this isn't to, to have some sort of reverse racism or some latter-day black nationalism that people won't uh, be able to access. But the point is that when, you know, in letter from a Birmingham jail, um, Malcolm or, or M- Martin Luther King Jr. basically told you it's not, you know, our enemies that we're going to worry about. And, you know, in the long run, we're going to remember the silence of our friends, the supposed friends who tell us to go slowly and want to control how radical we get and all that. Malcolm X, the same thing that, you know, um, foxy white liberals will have you just like totally thinking they're in your camp and they'll be selling you cyanide, cultural suicide the entire time. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and um, you know, Erica Sanzi put here that this is a good time to remind folks that a city like San Francisco, for instance, this is just a hard example. One of the most progressive cities in the United States has a 58 point gap between black and white students that they don't care about that they have been called on the carpet for and they haven't responded to. The NAACP has gone up to the San Francisco school board and said, we demand you declare an emergency, a crisis of education mm-hmm. in this city with no response whatsoever. My organization put out a report showing that San Francisco isn't rare. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of progressive cities across the country, the ones we would think are doing the best, super college educated, a lot of money, um, are doing very poorly with, with black kids. A 58 point gap between black and white students in one of the most progressive cities in the country, yet try and open a black charter school in San Francisco and see what happens, mm-hmm. right? They will run you out of town in a heartbeat, call you every kind of privatizer, um, make, make hell for you. You've done this for a long time. You've done it in multiple places. I think we both have agreed that it's the right thing to do I actually tend tend to think that they're going to wear out people who try and do it. I mean, what would you say to people who just see it as too much of an issue? Like, it, like they don't need this problem in their life of trying to start schools and deal with these people. Yeah, no, and 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 I, 
I understand where they're coming from. And I think that's why, you know, earlier I said, like, we have to support them. We have to give them, you know, uh, cover, you know, so that they can do the work because, it, you know, some people are not, you know, they just they want to just educate children. Right. They don't want to, despite the fact that how political education is, they don't want to have to constantly do that kind of fight. They believe one and they're right in some ways it distracts them from the pedagogy that needs to be happening. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. we're in a situation where you can't not mm -hmm. do it, right? You you just can't. Uh, uh, even if you're doing exceptionally well, they're going to be coming after you, trying to find ways to undermine you every step of the way. When we look at like David Hardy, mm -hmm. uh, when he wanted to open wow. up a black school for boys in a city where only half of them graduate high school in four years, right? And so he's saying like, hey, here's the group that's most marginalized. They're the most suspended, most expelled, have the lowest college going rate, you know, like I think at that time, you know, something like 12 out of 100 were actually going to college, hmm. you know, 12 out of 100 boys, right? And so he's saying, hey, let's start a school. You would have thought that he said, let's put all the black kids in the <laughs> guillotine. Like, I mean, the yeah, idea of yeah. him starting a school brought out everybody who's looked at as progressive and forward thinking and, oh, I'm all about education, except that type. Mm -hmm. You're talking about some mm -hmm. independent black school for black boys, despite mm -hmm. the fact that we're not doing anything well by them. Mm -hmm. Oh, you need to be you need to be thrown in jail. You know, right? what's so interesting about that is I think often when they say at least our schools are underneath the Democratic control of a locally elected school board, what they're basically saying is the control over these schools is in a system we can control still. Because exactly. because let's be real, we don't elect school board members. Teachers <laughs> unions do. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, let's mm -hmm. just be real about that. We don't control school boards. They don't they don't recognize our authority, or our independence. They recognize authority and independence of people that elect them. So saying that we're all for black schools as long as they're within the system that we control still um, is a great way to make sure there's no revolutionaries ever. No educational yeah. revolutionaries ever. That's terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and so I, th I do think a part of this conversation has to be, as you said, like independent. And, you know, some of these mm -hmm. have to be just private schools. And and mm -hmm. and so, you know, our, you know, wealthy benefactors in the, in the black community, uh, I'm hoping that they look at just private schools as an option mm -hmm. for black children, for more black children, um, so that it can be independent of some of the bureaucracy <laughs> and politics. I'm I'm getting trolled. I love you. The little girl way. behind you. She should join the show. <laughs> yeah, my little four-year-old. You know, uh, um, I'm loving it. And but this is the thing. Like when I when I'm doing this work, I'm like, how many? You know, every all families have children just like this one. You know, precocious, outgoing, fearless. Mm -hmm. And where did does, does that get beaten down out of them? You know, a mm -hmm. lot of times it's in the same places where they're supposed to be protected and nurtured and and things like that. And so. Um, when I, I I look at our, our the school that I went to as an elementary school uh, kid, right? And so it was always looked at as we are educating people, these children, to continue the liberatory efforts of our ancestors. Like that was the framework. I can't go down the street to my public school and say, oh, yeah, this is what why this school was created. Mm -hmm. The whole premise, the whole foundation of the school was different because of that. Mm hmm Right. And so when we were being nurtured and, and, and given this positive racial identity, this racial consciousness, this political education as, as fourth and fifth and sixth graders. Right. Like it was for a very reason. Imagine if if more of the public schools, if they were actually talking about like what Dr. King said is is for, you know, uh, you know, the two parts of education, yeah. so not only to be smart, character, but also character. have this. Exactly. This moral yeah. character. Right. Yeah. And but I think the third part you have to add is that you have to have this critical consciousness, this racial consciousness as a part of it. If you're a, a black child, mm -hmm. you've made this point over and over again. We don't just need more black teachers in education. We don't need just need more black schools. We need more conscious uh, black teachers and conscious black black schools. Uh, what do you mean by that? When you say that you make a distinction, what is it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So that again, if, if you do not have love, if you've internalized racial oppression, if you've internalized anti-blackness and it comes out in your lesson plans, it comes out in how you discipline and, and build relationships, it comes out in how you manage a classroom, it comes out in how you assess whether students are learning or what they're worthy of learning, 
all of that is even more oppressive than you know mm -hmm. some some white person just coming in um and and doing this very same thing you look like that mm -hmm. child and so that child will also internalize the oppression and the anti-blackness so when we when i'm thinking about educators again i'm thinking about the educator the type of educators that i had right who said hey we are we are, we have a freedom choir and we are going to mm -hmm. sing liberatory songs we're going to wow. sing songs about you know uh the resistance and and our heroes and and we are going to study history in the context we didn't call it black history it was just history mm -hmm. right like that's like that's in, true in, yeah we you know that's like chinese food in china is not called chinese food exactly it's called food right it's called food, <laughs> yeah, right? yeah so wow. that's how yeah. imagine if we have that kind of 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 upbringing and having those kind of people making sure that it is safe for black children not just physically emotionally culturally intellectually spiritually mm -hmm. those are the things that we um you know that we need uh more of you know, I actually, um, and it's a good place to end. I want to say, Sharif, we should keep having this conversation because there's so much to unpack about the history, the pedagogy, the philosophy of what we're talking about. We unpacked a, a, just a small piece of all of that today, mm -hmm. but this should be an ongoing conversation that we should keep having because we need to educate ourselves and, and our others that we come into contact with about the story that's not being told. Yeah, right. On an ongoing basis. So to people who have watched this and who have, have made comments, thank you all so much for that. You can see how you can get in touch with um, Sharif going at the bottom there. He's at Cell uh on Twitter. You can find him and you can find me there also at Citizen Stewart. What I want to invite us to do is we're going to keep having this conversation possibly on Fridays. But, you know, Sharif, you and I can talk about this offline, but mm -hmm. we have a list of things in a bibliography that we think are really important to create yeah. a basis for this discussion. Yes. There are there are like, there's research we're not talking about, there's facts in history that we're not talking about, and we wanna share them with each other over time. Um, that, that it's all there. We have mm -hmm. the knowledge, we have the information, we're not sharing it with each other and we're not uh, making it available to everybody. So let's keep doing that. You down, Absolutely. Sharif? I am, I am, I'm looking forward to it. And thanks for having me. This is a fantastic, uh, you know, uh, setup you, and platform. Everybody who's in the comments, if you're interested in this ongoing conversation, just drop a comment down there. I will be in touch with you. And um, you can also send me an email so that I know my email is Christopher at activist.com. And uh, we'll keep the conversation going. Thank you all. Thanks, Sharif. Peace.